Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Tuesday seminars of the Cerebellum. Today, I think we have something really interesting. Uh, Frank Van Olewald, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Free University in Brussels, um, has been, uh, for the last decade or so, interested in looking at the role of Cerebellum in understanding what other people are thinking about and how to respond to them and how to uh, put together action sequences, something that uh, uh, I think we uh, rely on so much in our daily daily lives. Um, Frank, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for inviting you. I've, I'm feeling very honored that I can speak to this large cerebellum audience. And indeed, I'm going to talk about the role of the social cerebellum. And I start with a little view on our capital, Brussels, which uh, is what probably tourists expect from medieval cities. Um, and also on the right, you see the attributes that are expected when they visit Brussels, uh, French fries, which we call Belgian fries, of course, Belgian beers, and so on. So this is a picture that depicts all cliches that tourists expect. And my main point is that, in effect, the cerebellum is doing more or less the same thing. It works with routines and cliches about actions and other things. We know that uh, cere cerebellum, well, the brain can be up divided up in seven major networks. The functions have been discovered some 10 years ago based on resting states uh, scanning. And the cerebellum has the same makeup in a primary and a secondary representation of these seven networks and also a third one. And if you pull this out and then flatten it, then you can you can get this representation, which is probably familiar to most of you. And the up and bottom part are the interior uh, uh, cerebellum and the middle part is the posterior cerebellum. And that represents the seven uh, networks again. And recently we published also a uh, parcellation of the cerebellum, not based on uh, resting state, but on task related uh, data from the Neurosynth database. And we uncovered more or less the same parcellation structure uh, this with seven uh, major networks and an additional language network. And compared to earlier representations, ours is here on the top left, and at the bottom is the resting state uh, parcellations that have been published by Buchner and me. And as you can see, it's quite similar, especially the mentalizing area, the one in red, with what, what we are going to focus on, which is uh, overlapping with the default mode network. Now, uh, an interesting point of our postulation is that the terminology and the interpretation was based on the terms, the key terms used in neuroscience, which is by itself based on the key terms used in the articles themselves. So we didn't make the interpretation. It's based on what was already there in the neuroscience database. And so we are going to focus this talk on the social function of the cerebellum on these areas mainly, cruise two and cruise one, as they are also known, or the mentalizing parts of the cerebellum. And one of the earlier uh, researchers that attempted or discovered functions of the cerebellum that were not related to motion as was done classically before, that was in the beginning of the 90s, discovered a whole range of functions of the cerebellum, but one was missing for one reason or another that we don't understand, but there was nothing about social. A lot of effects, cognit cognition, but nothing about social. So in the year 2014, we started doing a, and a year before, we started doing a meta-analysis on the potential role of the cerebellum and the potential role in social uh, mentalizing tasks and in action, social action observation. Uh, which is called mirroring, and the other three uh, categories are social mentalizing. And we found a robust activation in about 30% of the studies, uh, which was, to our, in our view, quite remarkable because quite often the cerebellum is not measured, scanned completely, or not reported even. And to show you how remarkable this is, I show on the left two categories on um, event mentalizing, 
or abstract mentalizing or abstract uh, parts of uh, types of mentalizing about future, past, and so on. On the left, from our meta-analysis, and on the right, the mentalizing area from Buchner based on resting state. And the similarity, as you can see, is remarkable. So this really motivated us to pursue this, uh, to explore this part of the cerebellum that was seemed to be dedicated to uh, mentalizing. And another study meta-analysis that we did in the 20s, uh, 2020, was one in which we explored it in a different way. We selected four regions of interests based on our previous studies and on the neuroscience database. And then we looked for the studies and the type of tasks they had that activated these regions of interest. And as you can see, in about 75% of the cases, these were studies involving some social or emotional uh, experiences. So attributions and uh, also mentalizing about emotions and mentalizing about uh, social actions explicitly or implicitly. So this confirms our er earlier meta-analysis so we were wondering what is the cerebellum doing in all these domains? There are different theories. There have been uh, different talks about this in this uh, series of seminars. But we found one which was of most interest for us. That was the idea that the primary role of the cerebellum is to identify and support and detect temporal sequences in events or actions, including social actions so that it allows to predict future actions and also very importantly, so that it allows to uh, identify and detect violations in these sequences so that people can quickly adjust their behaviors, if, for example, in a social interaction. We call this a sequencing hypothesis and you will hear that word sequencing a lot of times in my talk here. So we went on to exploring the last five years or so the social function of the cerebellum. And we wondered, is a social cerebellum really a social interaction, a kind of dance where you have to watch out not to make any violations in the sequence of your behaviors? Or is the cerebellum not related to this? So we used a task like this one where participants were shown cartoons of events four cartoons like this, and they had to put them in the correct temporal chronological order. And I do this now for you to show you how it works. And you see, this is a very easy one. It's a mechanical uh, condition, as we call it. And it's uh, an accident with a truck. You have more social ones, but they reflect social routines, like going to the shop and then paying and then leaving the shop. There are more difficult ones, and these are single events, and uh, you, you have only a few seconds to figure out, which is usually not enough to figure out what the correct order is. But actually, the secret here is that it's about a false belief. The boy looks at this uh, chocolate box, he finds that there's still a chocolate left there, then he leaves the room. Somebody else, the naughty Annie here, eats its chocolate so that the person is really surprised that the box is uh, empty. And we call this a false belief because there is a distinction between your perspective as you see reality and the perspective of the boy as he sees reality. He doesn't know that it was eaten by somebody else. And this is a key task of social mentalizing. False belief is being considered the most difficult mentalizing task because you have to distinguish be between your perspective and the perspective of, of another person. So it's quite important. And therefore, we studied these among uh, patients with cerebellar deficiencies, generalized cerebellar deficiencies. And as you can see here in uh, the study by uh, Sarah de Koning, that uh, they do quite well, these uh, patients uh, in the uh, former the former two conditions, but on false beliefs, they really have difficulties to find the correct sequence. Then we were reinforced and uh, interest becoming more interesting in this uh, phenomena. And then we did some scanning studies with neurotypical participants 
and we added a true belief condition. So in this case, for example, uh, the boy calls the girl to eat together the chocolate. So the perspectives of everyone are just the same. And as you can see, both in the false belief tasks and in the true belief condition, uh, the posterior cerebellum was uh, activated. And this was a study by Elin Heenhaven. And also we had a verbal version of the task in which we used little sentences describing similar events and we found the same effect. The posterior cerebellum was more activated during false and true beliefs. Now we developed novel sequencing tasks during the last years and they all involved more or less the same design. We separated sequencing from social content. So we had four conditions in which we compared sequencing versus non-sequencing in a social or a non-social condition. And we focus on, of course, the main target of our comparison is a social sequencing condition, which uh, to make things a bit easier to read, I abbreviated to social as you will see later. So that's the main condition. And what were the kinds of tasks we developed? One of the tasks was, is this person honest or not? So we provide, and that was a study by Min Poole, we provide information describing a person Lixia, for example, tells a testimony to the police, tells the truth, uh, makes a confession, and so on and so on. As you can see, this person is very honest. Now, in one condition, participants were required to infer that trait, but also to reproduce exactly the same order of the behaviors. And in other condition, the non-sequencing condition, they were not required to do so. And we also had control condition in control conditions in which it was not about persons, but at, about objects. So the non-social condition. Another study by Meja Lee was a study of goal-directed behavior in which we had different uh, social agents, the Smurfs, which are the one of the few Belgian little heroes. That's why we often use them in research. And they have certain goals and people have to, participants have to, de, to infer what the goal is, for example, of Papa Smurf or from Smurfette and so on. So this goes as, and in some conditions they had to replicate exactly the trajectory. And in other cases, that's a sequencing condition and in the other day need not to do so. So it goes as follows. Here is Papa Smurf, he's walking around. There are some obstacles with ex which explain why sometimes the trajectory is a bit erratic. He goes closer and we still don't know what he actually is up to. Is he going to money, flowers or cakes? It's still not unclear. And here, okay, he goes for the food item. So the participants infer the food item as the goal, and in some conditions they replicate exactly the trajectory, and some others they don't have to do this. Another task by Chenying Ma is a task where, again, our Smurfs are looking at the screen and they have to look at the number of flowers that is offered to them. But they can also turn their back to the screen so they don't know what is given to them. So that's a false belief in the last condition. So when they look at the screen, it's a true belief. They, can see, they, they see what is given to them. When they turn their back to the screen, they don't know what is uh, happening behind them. And so that's a false belief. And we give and the, some of these um these trials, true and false belief trials, the sequence of these false and belief, uh, false and true trials is uh, repeated over a number of trials uh, between 10, uh, 12, uh, 20 trials over and over again, or is randomized, as we will see. So in this case, the task is the answer, correct answer is one. The answer here is still one because he doesn't know that things have changed. The answer is two. The answer is still two. And that answer is still one. And so on and so on and so on. Now, what we see is that nevertheless, 
over time by repeating these sequences implicitly, because we never tell participants about this, they about this, this repetition, they do this quicker. That's an aspect of the serial response time task uh, by which you can learn implicit sequences. And when you randomize the sequence, uh, they slow down again compared to the standard sequence. Now, what are the results of all these studies? So the first study about traits showed that if we compare social sequencing against non-sequencing, then we have the posterior cerebellum. And if we compare social sequencing against the non-social condition, we get more or less in the same area uh, activation in the posterior cerebellum. The other task, goal-directed behavior, when we compare sequencing versus non-sequencing in the social domain, we see the posterior cerebellum. And if we compare social versus non-social in the same area. And for the implicit uh, sequencing of true and false beliefs, when we compare the tests where random uh, sequencing occurs versus the training uh, uh, condition where no randomization occurs, then we see the posterior cerebellum, and again, in the opposite contrast as well, and somewhere more or less the same location. So overall, our conclusion was, indeed, the posterior cerebellum is uh, activated in a wide range of tasks, going for from a very low-level goal-directed behaviors in beliefs and implicit sequences up to higher level trait inferences that require a high level integration of a lot of information about participants. So we were successful in this and we wondered, is the cerebellum also involved in prediction? It should be because the cerebellum is there to help us predict the next steps in the sequence and to warn us for any violations in these sequences. So. We studied action sequence prediction, and imagine here there is a riot going on. And then the question is, would you expect a behavior like this? Probably not, although you never know with young people. Um, so we, we did something similar, but then in a verbal way, in which we were showed uh, six um, uh, behaviors. And we started by saying Fumak is a dishonest person. Please select from these six behaviors the four ones that are consistent with this idea. And some were rather neutral, some were really consistent, indicating dishonesty, and some were really the opposite, uh, meaning that the person was honest. And in, they had to make a selection of, of these six into four. And in some conditions, they also had to, to put these uh, actions in the correct sequence. And in another condition, they did not have to do this. Only select four behaviors, but it could be in any uh, sequence. That was not important. So again, a distinction between sequence and non-sequence. And of course, we had similar things about objects that were light and were flying or whatever, uh, changing in the winds. Uh, but that was done the non-social condition. And again, social, non-social, the posterior cerebellum, and also social sequencing versus non-sequencing, similarly also in the posterior cerebellum. So overall, it's also helpful in making predictions about what people are going to do. Uh, and uh, we did the same for intentions uh, in deception or not, in people's preferences. Um, and then we wondered uh, what uh, this all has to tell us about, uh, for, for example, we, would also, uh, wonder, we were also wondering to what extent the cerebellum indeed identifies not only problems in the sequence, but also problems in the social inference itself. When people violate social, action, social norms, or violate their own stereotypes or their own traits. A uh, honest person all of a sudden is lying, for example. Then it seems logical that the cerebellum somehow picks this up because the normal continuation of social interaction is going wrong. If a person that you suspect or expect to be honest, all of a sudden uh, you uh, perceive that the person tells you a lie, then the normal way of social interaction should be interrupted and you should change a little bit how you react to this person. 
So we uh, analyzed this uh, processing of social violations by having a person that is here very uh, truthful again, and then all of a sudden begins to tell lies. So the whole idea of this, the whole perception of this person is changing uh, radically. And we were wondering, as soon as we tell something, uh, and of course, we first build up the expectation that the person is truthful, and then we present an action that is contrary to this. As soon as that was presented, that information was presented, how would the cerebellum react? And we did this also in collaborating teams, where one of the other team members was collaborating, well or not, and so violating the collaboration or violations of stereotypes, like a very famous uh, movie star that is looking for food in a dumpster. It's not quite what we expect them to do. And again, when we make that comparison, the posterior cerebellum was involved. Another one was, again, these trajectories where a papa's nerve is picking up a gift flowers, and then is bringing that gift to pop, uh, Smurfettes. But we manipulated the prior advanced information about whether Smurf Smurfette would like a flower or not. So in some cases, it was told beforehand, and Papa Smurf was uh, informed by the fact that it was either she liked it, so the gift was consistent, or she didn't like the gift. So this was socially inconsistent information. And again, when we made that comparison between inconsistent and consistent information, again, the posterior cerebellum was involved. So indeed, the cerebellum takes track of information from the cerebrum telling social, perhaps the sequence is right, but socially something is wrong. And then the cerebellum takes that also into account to say, mm, uh, something is wrong here. And the sequence is not as expected, although at the higher uh, social level, not at the level of sequences of behaviors. Now, in summary, uh, summarizing all these uh, studies we've done in the past, we have in total four uh, contrasts. One that uh, reveals the social preference, that's the blue one, social sequencing versus non-social sequencing. Then the red one is uh, signaling, indicating the sequencing preference of the cerebellum in the social domain, so sequencing versus non-sequencing. The green is the preference for, or at least the sensitivity to social violations. And the fourth one in gray is sequencing, but then in the non-social domain. And we wanted to compare this. And as you can see, in the top half, it's always in the posterior cerebellum. And the bottom row gives a, a description of preference or at least sensitivity for social information in blue, very strong. Sequencing of uh, social information also quite strong. Social violations also triggers the cerebellum quite well. But sequencing of non-social information, although it triggers also a little bit the posterior cerebellum, it's remarkably less strong and less widespread as the uh, blue uh, contrasts. And on the far right is then uh, again the subdivision in the networks of the mentalizing network uh, in rats to show that indeed the location is in uh, this part of the cerebellum. But interestingly, a lot of well, some of my colleagues claim that in sequencing also the basal ganglia are involved. And so far, we didn't study this. So we added uh, also the results uh, of the basal ganglia using regions of interest. And as you can see on the bottom row now, these are the activations most often in the anterior part of the basal ganglia. And as you can see, the basal ganglia are do not show much a preference for social information, and it's equally strong as for non-social information. They do have a, a sensitivity for sequencing of social information and uh, also for social violations. But is the, the preference for social information, if you compare with the cerebellum, is much less um, striking. <clears throat> 
we have to uh, follow up this. This is new uh, data that haven't been published yet. So we still have to figure out a little bit uh, what is going on in this basal ganglia and how to explain these differences. But this is uh, for future research. Uh, and then, of course, if the uh, cerebellum identifies sequences, it gets information from the cerebrum uh, and it sends it back to the same area. Uh, the cerebellum sends its identification and uh, a signal whether the sequence is, uh, is correct as expected or violated and sends that error signal back to the same area in the cerebrum. And that's what we call closed loop connectivity when the link is between the same areas in the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And we found some evidence for it in a meta-analysis that indeed the mentalizing areas in the cerebellum were connected to mentalizing areas in the cerebrum. As you can see here, the medial prefrontal cortex, the temporal parietal junction and the posterior cingulate, which are key uh, mentalizing areas in the cerebrum and the same for uh, mirroring or somatomotor areas. Now, we conducted a few uh, dynamic causal modeling studies. This is one of our first studies in which we studied across five studies, trait inferences. And as you can see, across the five studies, the right posterior cerebellum was activated. It's here at the bottom. And the white area is the mentalizing area. The TPJ, temporal parietal junction, is involved in perspective taking, social perspective taking, and actually involves a multimodal integration of inputs that drives the perspective that you will take. And the medial prefrontal on top is trait integration. And as you can see, there are closed loops, contralateral, ipsilateral, uh, from the cerebellum to the cerebrum, within the cere uh, cerebrum, and up to the medial prefrontal cortex. A very similar picture of the sequence uh, picture task that you've seen before. Now we also have activity at, at the left cerebellum and we find uh, contralateral closed loops, ipsilateral closed loops, again, within the cerebrum up to the medial prefrontal cortex. Meanwhile, we've conducted other dynamic causal modeling analyses from the task that uh, I've shown you before. And Constantly and even more frequently, we do find closed loops between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Now, there are, of course, some clinical implications, and one of the obvious clinical implications is autism. Autism, which is well known, is a difficulties uh, in social interaction and also often repeating behaviors is uh, are the symptoms of autism. And... Uh, there is a strong genetic factor uh, in uh, uh, autism, which is uh, shown here by studies in twins. If the twin, if you have an identical twin, which is uh, who is autistic, then you have fifty percent chance that you will also have autism. If you have, if you are so the, the identical genetic uh, setup, but. One of the most important non-genetic factors, uh, which is not so well known, is actually cerebellar injury at birth. This was studied among preterms, and they found if there are cerebellar injuries before birth, and irrespective of any uh, injuries or deficiencies at the cerebrum, but cerebellar injuries predicted increase the chances of autism by 36%, which is uh, quite high. And there's a lot of evidence also from the past uh, that there is reduced volume in autism uh, in the cerebellum mainly. And in a recent study, it showed that this reduced volume was uh, focused mainly on cruise one and two. So the superior, uh, sorry, the posterior cerebellum in again, the mentalizing area in red. Now, if you think about this, this, this can also explain the fact that uh, people with autism can have different symptoms, because if this is the core symptom, a reduced volume in mentalizing, social mentalizing area, perhaps some individuals might have deficiencies more at the interior part, so demonstrating more repetition of behaviors because they are limited there. 
And so deficiencies and impairments in other parts of the, the cerebellum might uh, be a marker of deficiencies in similar processes that are related to these other areas. But a common uh, thing is that there is reduced volume in the cerebellum and the posterior part, the mentalizing part of the cerebellum. So we wanted to test this, and we again had our famous uh, picture sequencing task of Lilin, and we compared uh, neurotypical participants with uh, autistic participants, and autistic participants are on the right in dark blue. And as you can see on the picture sequencing task, they did well, but they needed more time to do this. On the false belief, the true belief, and the social scripts, and the difference was not so large in the mechanical conditions. So uh, indicating indeed that uh, this is probably more related to the posterior cerebellum. Now, another thing that we can do uh, in these situations is provide training to people with autism based on the insights we had about the sequencing function of the cerebellum or brain stimulation as illustrated here uh, with TMS, uh, transmagnetic. Uh, stimulation. So that's what Eileen did. So she used transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct stimulation. Uh, direct stimulation is with a very uh, weak current that is put on the cerebellum. And with TMS, it's the cone that is put at the cerebellum. And no, there are no major uh, drawbacks or irritations in the muscles. This goes quite well. Um, and the result was that with TMS, there was a re reduction in the time. This is with neurotypicals. So participants became faster on all conditions. In the real stimulation condition, in the false or sham stimulation conditions, there were less changes. And in TDCS, the same pattern, except that for false belief, there was no reduction in response time. So they didn't go any faster. And again, in the sham condition, there were hardly any differences. So this is truly uh, due to the stimulation given to the uh, participants. Another study, recent study, was with the Smurf task and the flowers. And as you can see here on the top, Left are the Smurfs. On the top right is a cognitive control task where uh, people had to make their decision based on colors and format of the shape, whether it was a circle or a square. Uh, what we saw was that actually in the social condition, there was no change in response times. But in the cognitive condition, there was a decrease of response time, so they became faster. And our interpretation is that, at least for neurotypical participants, the social task probably is already so much uh, familiar to them that there is little to be gained by stimulating neurotypical participants. But for unfamiliar tasks, it helps them. In contrast, uh, perhaps, and that's still something we have to uh, figure out, uh, that is perhaps for people with autism, a social task may really help them to do a, a little bit faster. Another task was recently finished by Niam in our lab, and that's the study where we had these uh, predictions about the future. And what we found was that after TDCS stimulation, indeed, uh, as you can see at the bottom uh, on the left, that the posterior cerebellum became more activated uh, in the real condition compared to the sham condition. And also at the top, as you can see, also the key areas in the mentalizing uh, system, temporal parietal junction, medial prefrontal cortex, uh, cortex and the preconeus, were also more strongly activated, showing that, again, uh, the stimulation triggered the areas that were intended to be triggered. Um, we did not find performance changes, uh, increase in response time, uh, but that's often the case on the scanner because uh, for people who are familiar with scanning, they know they need to add random jittering in the task to make these estimates of the bolt function possible. And this, of course, uh, goes against quick responding. Uh, so the performance, uh, let's say, uh, 
under the scanning is less reliable than in an independent task where you don't have these uh, random uh, jittering of the response times and the stimulus presentation. Okay, another point that uh, might show you the power of uh, this approach of sequencing is a novel training program that we call the narrative training program that was based on these sequencing uh, principles. And as you can see, what we asked mainly to the participants was retelling stories that had been told before, um, and first with some aids and uh, visual aids, transition words, and then spontaneously. And the important part of retelling the story is that they should have they should be retold from the perspective of the storyteller. And secondly, that they should have the chronological sequence correct. And apparently, uh, the Tom who conducted this study told me. Uh, people with autism are not very good at this. They have quite often reverse sequences. Because of this, they don't understand quite well what the conflict, because it's usually about a conflict between pro two protagonists are about, or how it started, actually. So they don't have a good idea of what the, the, the gist of the story, and they don't make the correct inferences about what these people are thinking and what their motives were. So that was what the uh, training was about, retelling stories, generating stories. And on the other hand, we also provided some mini lessons. What is a regular uh, traditional story structure? What are important transition words? What are important words and elements of a story that reflect mentalizing about the protagonists? And all in all together, this took about six sessions of about two hours. And then we looked at the results. And as you can see in the picture sequencing task, they did much better uh, in true and false beliefs. And also another measure was the narrative coherence. And this is a coding sheet scheme that tells you whether chronology was correct and whether thematic understanding of the story was correct and coherent and so on. And as you can see, they mainly improved on uh, the, chrono uh, the chronology of the coherence, the chronology of the narrative, especially for the same stories that were given also before the training, not significantly so for uh, new stories. That was not significant, but you can see that it goes in the correct direction. And if we pull together all coherence indicators together, then you see there was an increase in coherence uh, both for similar stories as for new stories. So it generalizes to other stories that were they were required to tell. So all in all, it shows that our approach has some success in stimulation, has some excess in training programs. And as a final uh, point that I want to address here tonight, is something about predictive coding and autism. As you are perhaps aware, a major theory approach in autism is predictive coding, which boils down to the idea that in error coding and learning about uh, events, that people with autism have an atypical weighting of information. They often weight the, in, the recent information too heavily. So they are too sensitive to novel information and their error processing is also atypical. But among all these theories and uh, evidence that has been developed during the last year, no attention was given to sequencing. And there might be errors in sequencing as well. Although implicitly in this study, sequencing is going on, but it's not manipulated. So we were thinking about what if sequencing, and of course, tying this to the posterior cerebellum, which is related to autism and sequencing as well, what if the major cause of these impairments in and uh, difficulties among in autism are related to a short time perspective or a short time window? And I illustrate this visually by this. This is an event unfolding. A neurotypical person start from the beginning, follow the event up and make a full abstraction, potentially making little adjustments uh, if there is a change in their interpretation of the data, but they make a full abstraction of the full events. Whereas perhaps because of the shorter window, 
autistic participants uh, take a short-sighted view, let's say, uh, on the event and make an abstraction that is only fragmented. And then they start this over again for the next section and the next section. And as you can see, uh, people with autism weight new information too heavily because they focus too much on it, which research has shown. And also their abstractions are a little bit off and not, not always so adequate, which research has shown as well. And we wanted to test this on a uh, the social uh, abstraction level for social abstractions. We haven't finished the research yet, but we studied already the neurotypical participants on this task, an ultimatum task, where uh, you play against some partner, the partner has 10 points, proposes you a division, she keeps eight, you only get two. Do you agree or not? Of course, you will not agree. Nobody gets anything. And so you can punish the uh, player, the other player, for not being uh, fair. And of course, you force them more or less to be more fair in the future. And uh, we had uh, two teams of four participants. Some were more egoistic, some were more generous. Some provided their offers in a very stable way, some in a more volatile way. And what is not what was not told to the participants was that the trial sequence was repeated all the time, with a few exceptions, and also a few exceptions in the offers they made. But the essence was that uh, it was always repeated. And what we did, uh, we provided one sequence on the first group of partners, another sequence of the se on the second group of four partners, and we had, in one condition, a long sequence. So four blocks, and then we turned to the other block of the second group of partners, and then again to the first block, and so on and so on. Whereas in the short condition, it was always changed per block. So it was very um, fragmented and let's say it was probably more difficult to learn the sequence because it was always interrupted with, with the sequence of the other group. And indeed, and this was turned around for, for counterbalanced in the whole experiment. Now, the interesting part is that even for neurotypical participants, the short window was much more difficult to learn, as you can see, that is the response time that you see here. And actually, they ended up uh, at about 600 milliseconds to, resp to respond, where in the long window, right from the start, this went very quickly, and overall, the responses were much shorter and faster. And what we also found was, and we think that this, of course, short window should be, we expect this to be rather typical for autism, still a question mark. What we also found was that volatility also plays a role, not so much in the long condition, but especially in the short window condition. And we think this is probably also a typical symptom of autism. But this is ongoing research, so we still have to look for and gathering now autistic participants. And this is about all that I am going to talk about. And I thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. I guess I should stop sharing. Uh, that's, that's fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if you have questions for Frank. Maybe I'll start first. Frank, I was surprised by the TMS experiment and how it provided the same result as the TBCS experiment. It just made things faster. Do you want to comment about that? Uh... Actually, the TDS was more clear. The evidence was clearer because there, in the sham condition, there were almost no differences. In the TMS, there were some differences, but overall, it was faster. And so, yeah, um, we are not, let's say, we're not surprised that it works, that is faster responding because we expected some performance effects being more accurate, that's not what is the case. That's also what you saw with autism. They're not more accurate, but they're faster at finding the correct order. So it seems if a, a task that seems to be quite sensitive to these uh, uh, sequencing manipulations. But Rich, yeah, other from that, sorry? Uh, that's fine, thank you, Frank. Rich had a question. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, question is about uh, uh, your emphasis on kind of the union 
of social and sequencing. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that uh, as opposed to the notion about sequence. You started off making it sound like it was gonna be about sequencing in general, and then it kind of veered more towards the social sequence kind of union as sort of the special domain to engage the cerebellum. And just wanted to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that. Well, we took the idea that sequencing is the general function, temporal sequencing, or and sometimes timing is the general function in the cerebellum. But you have to admit in mentalizing, it doesn't matter so much what the exact timing is. In social interaction, real interaction, it doesn't matter. If somebody is not talking for a few seconds, it's like, oh, I did something wrong or so. But in mentalizing, making inferences, it's not so time sensitive. So we focused on the temporal sequence. And to answer your question, we think that the posterior cerebellum is especially sensitive to temporal sequences in the social domain. And this goes together also with the evolution of the medial prefrontal cortex, which increased during the evolution of Homo sapiens and its predecessors. At the same time, the posterior cerebellum also increased in volume. So the two are very much related. Uh, and there is a hypothesis that says actually that the uh, increase of the medial prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobes, actually have to do a lot with social constraints like uh, collaboration. So there is a, a linear line, let's say, between the number of uh, people in your group uh, you have to collaborate with, and the increase of the frontal lobes. Uh, actually, the the it was the evidence is more related to the increase of the total brain, but it was mainly due to the frontal lobes. So uh, humans, uh, apes, and pred predecessors all show a nice increase. The more uh, people in the group, or uh, no, people. Uh, uh, animals in the group, the larger the brain in comparison to the body became. And we focus on that posterior part that uh, evolved most recently in evolution, and which is probably most attuned to social information, less no, I, to non-social information. Yeah, I thought that, uh, that that would make a nice um, case for why the posterior for the social interactions. But if it was... Um, sequence general, then then you might expect that there would be a different part of the cerebellum that might be showing, you know, enhanced activation when you do the contrast of non-social sequence versus social sequence, uh, reflecting the domain that those non-social sequences are, are are all about. And I don't know. You're right. You... Uh, and we didn't find this. Maybe, I don't know why this is so. We see a little bit of non-social activating a little bit of the, the posterior cerebellum but not much. So it's also sensitive. Maybe it has to do with an influ the, the, the conditions influencing each other because quite often the trials are randomly presented. So you get a social trial, then a non-social one. So there is a task set that gears you towards social information and sometimes it's social, sometimes it's not. So that might be the reason why we don't find a totally different activation. I think if you would focus, uh, if you would have a, not a task focusing on language, well, language is quite often overlapping with uh, mentalizing as well, because language stories are also about people, but arithmetics or something, uh, maybe that would activate a totally different area in the cerebellum, if you would have a, 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 a separate task on this one. Now it was randomized, which is required in psychological testing uh, to avoid some of the effects, order effects, uh, and maybe that might determine a kind of task set. I don't know. Um, if uh, no one else is jumping in, I'll ask a, a second question, unrelated question, um, which is, uh, um, it sounds like in your notion, the uh, cerebellum is a sense uh, computing the error, the mismatch, the violation of the sequencing. Um, and in the uh, uh, motor domain, that's been kind of a, a subject of debate. Is the cerebellum really computing the error? Is it more setting up the prediction and then the comparison is elsewhere with the error signaled to the cerebellum by, you know, by the climbing fibers and so forth? And so, again, I wanted to just hear a little bit more of your thoughts about this notion about doing the computation or the comparison that leads to the detection of an error or or in a sense, setting up uh, the prediction where the error comparison is elsewhere. 
I have no clue. I mean, I wouldn't know how to set up a study, at least in the social domain. Uh, this is far beyond my capacities and also so much. That's something it's difficult to either to address with scanning, fMRI, or even with stimulation. I mean, um, the effect is so uh, widespread. We are happy to uh, activate and stimulate the posterior cerebellum, but beyond this, um, I have no clue how to address this question. Thank you. Uh, it, it needs smarter people than me, maybe in the cognitive domain, to figure out how exactly it works. Uh, Frank, have you um, noticed in the cerebellar patients um, any symptoms that you think are related to the studies that you described? You described at the beginning, there was one study with the patients. So I'm wondering, um, are there other aspects of their behavior than their daily life that you might point to as an interesting correlate? Well, I don't know so much about the uh, cerebellar patients we had, but um, in autism, it's well known that people with autism have small motor problems quite often. So that's why I related to this as perhaps the common focus is on the posterior cerebellum and reduction of volume, but perhaps there might be in some individuals reductions elsewhere in volume so that these individuals have more motor problems in small motor uh, behaviors um, and perhaps other uh, people with autism might have more cognitive problems in the sense that their executive areas are more um, uh, deficient. Uh, some others might have more sensory problems, are being overloaded by information, sensory information, because they're at the, in that part of the cerebellum. I think this is an interesting uh, issue for further research, but it's, of course, all these differences. You need enough participants to uh, deal with, uh, to answer these questions. It's not easy to conduct such research. But I guess this uh, explains in part the diversity among the autism group. It is an interesting um, situation because you have a lot of cases or it's a subject of debate about, you know, what's the difference between cerebellar insult early in life versus late in life, right? And uh, you seem to have a much more severe, say, cognitive profile with early insult and things that you don't really see late in life, like you don't see you know, radical changes in language or I think even social behavior and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But in, in your case, um, you could still have sort of the autism story about, you know, problems in development of the cerebellum, but you're also showing that you seem, you want to contend that, you know, you see very similar operations being performed in the healthy adult cerebellum. So it's, you know, one notion has been that these early insults sort of, cerebellum is important to set certain things up, but then once you get through development, this, the contribution of the cerebellum you know, drops off in a sense. And that's why you don't see problems in the patients who acquire late lesions. But that wouldn't really work in your case because you're still seeing... Mm -hmm. sort of yeah, but among, yeah, among people with autism, you, see, you also see deficiency or lower activation in these uh, areas, the key areas of mentalizing. You see uh, less activation in TPJ, less activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. And there's one study that showed that... Uh, if you have uh, defects in preterm, so before birth, birth, at that moment, the cerebrum is not so important. So it's whether you have deficiencies there, it's not important. But it seems to affect the cerebrum two, the, two years later, the development of the cerebrum. So, And there it might affect these areas that have to do with mentalizing. That's a potential uh, reason why if you study people with uh, autism, that you also see deficiencies in the cerebrum. Right. I mean, I wasn't actually uh, contesting that there's probably also some major changes in cerebral function, but it was this notion that some folks have, you know, played with is that uh, the cerebellum might be essential for setting up certain abilities, but then uh, um, after a point, it's sort of taken over by the cerebral cortex, you know, post-development. And so the cerebellum isn't so critical for, say, these social, you know, processing uh, in the mature brain, but in your 
work doesn't really go along with that idea, right? At least the imaging stuff is saying that, look, we're still seeing, you know, pronounced cerebellar engagement during these operations, even though the patient work, you know, obviously more to be done to see, do you see real changes in the, when you yeah. have insight to the mature? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The cerebellum among neurotypical individuals has a strong, has an important function. Otherwise, it wouldn't do the work, for sure. But whether the cerebellum is uh, def defects in the cerebellum really grow out to defects in the cerebrum, that's a hypothesis, which have I've seen confirmed in one study. But there's no strong evidence yet uh, whether that is uh, generally true or not. That's uh, correct. Thank Thanks. you so much, Frank. Are, are there any other questions for Frank? Rich, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that excellent discussion. And I'm so grateful. Frank, thank you so much for your for your time and for bringing us up to speed on this. I hope you have a good Tuesday, everybody. Okay, and thank you for listening all to this and uh, your interest in the social cerebellum. Thank you. Good night.